Hello, my name is Zach Gibbs and I am a content developer within education services inside Juniper Networks. And today we will be going through the Configuring Juniper Secure Connect Security Director Part 1 Learning Bite. Okay, so here is our example. In this example, I want to first talk about the topology. And here in the topology, you can see a couple of different devices. We have SRX1, which we will be configuring using Security Director. And then SRX1 is connected to the users in the branch, which is the user's zone. And then we have Server1, which is connected into SRX through the server's zone. And then we have the internet, which connects to the SRX1 using the untrust zone. And so what we have here is we have a remote worker who needs access to server one. And so what we want to do is we want to use security director to configure Juniper Secure Connect. And we're going to use local authentication. And that is good for a small business where you don't have a lot of workers. If you have hundreds of people who need access, remote access that is, then you'll probably want to use something like Radius authentication where it'll be a lot easier to manage all those users. And so with that being said, we have our remote worker who needs access to server one. And this remote worker should not be able to access hosts that are in the user's zone. And so with that being said, let's go ahead and jump to security director and get this going. All right, so here is security director and we're currently in the configure workspace. And we'll do some work in here, but first we need to jump to the devices workspace. So here is SRX1, and the first thing we need to do is we need to create the local certificate that we'll be using. And to do that, there's no real easy way in Security Director. And so we'll need to use the access option to launch an SSH session to SRX1. And then log in. And here in SRX1, we're going to first create the key pair that we're going to use. Specify a size of 2048 and then a type of RSA. And then the certificate ID we're going to use is Juniper RALB for Learning Byte. So Remote Access Learning Byte. Okay, great. That's created. Let's go ahead and use that key pair to create a certificate. Specify a certificate ID of that key pair. And then specify a subject. We're going to say DC equals Juniper, CN equals EDU. Then domain of edu.juniper.net. And then we need to specify an IP address. And this is very important because this IP address will need to reference when creating the remote access VPN using Juniper Secure Connect. Click enter to create that certificate. Okay, so we're good there. So we can close that. And that's the only thing we'll need to do in the CLI today. And then we need to do some more device configuration. We'll go to configuration, modify configuration. Okay, so we need to scroll down to the very bottom here and we'll see system services. We'll expand that. Scroll down some more and we see at the very bottom HTTPS services. That's currently not turned on. We need to select allow to turn that on. And then if we scroll down, we can select some interface. If we don't select any interfaces, then it's going to be applied to all interfaces. And by default, we have system generated certificate. We want to change that to PKI local certificate and then select the certificate that we just created. We could specify a different port, but we need to leave that at the default of 443. And then the next thing we need to configure is we need to configure the security zone, the untrust security zone. It's already configured here, but we need to edit it and add in some system services. And if we scroll down, we have system services. Oh, went a little too far. HTTPS is necessary. And then TCP encapsulation. And then IKE. Then we can click OK. And then we can preview changes to Kind of see what we're doing here. And you can see here it's pretty straightforward. We're adding HTTPS, IKE, and TCP and CAP to the untrust zone for host inbound traffic. And then we are setting the web management HTTPS certificate to the Juniper RA-LB, that certificate we just created a few moments ago. 
So close that and click save and deploy. And that'll just take a second after we click OK again to run it. And great, uh, that job went through successfully. Let's go ahead and click OK. Now we can jump back to configuration mode. And we're going to need to create a few things. Let's go ahead and start with the firewall policy that we'll need. So let's create a new policy. We'll call this RA FW Paul for short for policy. And then we'll move SRX1 over. And then we need to create some firewall rules for this policy. So we'll call this from remote workers. And then the source address or the source information is going to be VPN. It'll be coming into the VPN zone. And then it'll be going to the servers zone. And here, let's go ahead and select an address. We'll select and add the server address here. And granted, that does say server123. It's actually server1. That's the IP address of server1. I uh, meant to change that earlier, but here we have it. Click OK. Then we'll select permit under advanced security. And we could add different parameters here, such as IPS or app firewall if we wanted to scan this traffic, or IDP, threat prevention, things like that. And then let's go ahead and jump to the end and finish off this rule. And then we need to create a rule for the server. So we'll say to remote worker. So source address, this will be coming from the server's zone. And we're going to select that server address. And then in the destination information, we're going to select the VPN zone. And then, of course, permit the traffic. And you could add additional security checks here if you wanted to, of course. And then rule placement, we'll just click Finish, click OK. And so things look pretty good there. We'll go ahead and save that and we'll publish it, but we won't update the devices yet because we can do a publish now and then an update later once we have everything else configured that we're doing for this learning byte. And great, you can see that went through successfully, that job, no problems there. So let's go ahead and move on to the NAT configuration. So we'll go to NAT policy, policies, and let's create a new NAT policy. And I'll explain why we're doing this, because there's a specific reason to do this. Give it a name, select SRX1. And then let's create a new rule here. Create a source rule. And then the source ingress information, we're going to say from zone VPN. And source address, we're just going to put down any IPv4 address. So we'll match on everything coming in from the VPN zone. And you could specify more specific information here if you would like. And then destination egress, we're going to specify the server's zone. And then we're going to specify translation of interface. So it's going to be the source interface. And what we're doing here, let me explain the reason behind this. So traffic's going to be coming in from the VPN zone. And we haven't done it, and we'll do this in the next learning byte, that is the second part of this learning byte, but we will have to assign the remote worker a certain IP address. And the server won't know how to get to that IP address, or rather, it'll think it'll need to use the default route to get to that IP address. And so if it does that, it'll send the traffic to the SRX. The SRX will think it needs to use a default route and then send the traffic out its internet facing interface without putting the traffic in the tunnel. So we can get around this problem by doing a source NAT on the traffic coming in from the VPN going towards the server. Because what happens is we are doing source NAT on that interface that is pointing towards the server one device. And so what happens is that traffic comes in, the source net changes it to the IP address, which in this case is 10.60.60.254. Then the server being 10.60.60.100 knows that it just sends it to the 10.60.60.254 address. And when that happens, reverse source net will take the traffic and then change the IP address, which then gets it into the tunnel. And so this allows the routing to happen as needed. 
And so what we could do besides this is we could use some sort of static routing to put the return traffic back inside the tunnel. So let's go ahead and publish this. And then we'll move on after that. And that job is complete. So let's go ahead and close that window. And then let's go ahead and go back to devices. And then we'll do an update. And we'll update those two changes for firewall policy and NAT to SRX1. And those firewall policies and NAT policy were successfully pushed to SRX1. And so quickly, let's look at the topology as a reminder. We have SRX1, which has three different interfaces. We have the user's zone connection, the server's zone connection, and the untrust zone connection. And the user's zone houses the users in the branch, and the server's zone houses server one, and the untrust zone connects to the internet. And we have the remote worker who needs to connect in to SRX1 into this site. And then they need to be able to access server one. Now with that, the remote worker should not be able to access anything in the user zone, but only should be able to access server one. And so we're using security director to configure this and we're using local authentication. And so with that, let's go ahead and jump to security director to finish this learning byte series. Okay, so here is Security Director. Recall from the last Learning Byte that we created the local certificate, we configured the SRX1 device to use that local certificate, and then we created some firewall policies as well as a source NAT policy. So next, let's go to Configure Workspace, and then go to IPsec VPN, IPsec VPNs, and then Create VPN, Route-based VPN, and then Remote Access Juniper Secure Connect. And here we can name the VPN. Then we can give a description that's not necessary. We have to use the Traffic Selector Auto Route Insertion option, and we'll see how that's configured. We can specify a VPN profile, but using the default works well. And then the method for what we need to use is pre-shared key since we're using local authentication. And the pre-shared key, we can either define one or we can just auto-generate it. And auto-generation is perfectly fine for here. And we can use the generate a unique key per tunnel as well. And that's set to on. And then to begin, we need to click the remote user icon. And that starts us off with asking us which device we want this to be for. And we just have SRX1 here. Typically, when using Security Director, you'd have a lot more than SRX1. But since this is a learning byte, that's all we need to do. We click OK there, and then we have the remote user configuration. Again, we are using the default profile. Connection mode is set to manual. We could have it set to always, but manual works fine for what we're doing. SSL VPN, we want to leave that on. We have dead pair detection configured as well by default, and Windows login is not selected as well as biometric authentication. Both of those can be configured for a remote access VPN with Juniper Secure Connect. We'll click OK. Then the next thing we need to do is select the SRX1 device to configure the rest of it. External interface, that's going to be Gigi001. And notice how the 10.111.111.1 IP address is associated with that. Remember that in the previous learning byte, we referenced that IP address when creating the certificate. The tunnel zone, in our case, it's going to be VPN. Now I created that zone beforehand. And then user authentication, there's nothing to select here. So let's go ahead and add some user authentication. And notice here up top, this is very important. It says update access profile before updating remote VPN. Now, when I first tried to do this, I didn't see that and things didn't work out. I tried to push the configuration and it failed. And that's because after we create the VPN, before we send it to the device, we need to go to the remote access configuration and update that first. So keep that in mind. That's incredibly important. Uh, set this to local. And of course, there's nothing for address assignment yet, so we need to create an address pool. And we'll call this pool ra-pool-sd-lb. And then we need to specify the network address. We'll use that 10.77.77.0. Make that a slash 24. And then we need to specify a DNS server that the user can use. And then let's go ahead and specify an address range that can be used within that pool. First, we need to call it. We'll call this ra pool sd-lb 
and we'll set the lower limit to 10.77.77.10. So we're going to start handing out IPs with that address. Then a high limit of 10.77.77.50. Go ahead and click the checkbox and click OK. And then we need to add a local user. Lab Lab123, pretty standard for education services there. And then we're done with the address assignment part and the user authentication. Now we need to use an SSL VPN profile. There's nothing here, so we do need to add one. And we'll call this SSL VPN SD LB for the profile name. And we need to create an SSL termination profile. And this is something that we're just going to name here and the system will create the actual profile for us. Because what happens with this profile is the termination profile that is, is that we name it and then we reference the certificate. And then we reference that certificate that we created in the previous learning byte and click OK. And we're not quite done yet. We have to specify a protected network. Now here we have an address of server 123, which is actually server 1. I meant to change that before did these learning bytes, but that's the IP address associated with server 1. And that works great. And when we do this, this automatically will create a scenario where split tunneling happens, meaning only traffic to the server is going to go through the tunnel for the remote worker. And all other traffic will use the remote worker's normal internet connection. And that's exactly what we want. Now, if we didn't want that, we'd have to specify an address that is a default address, so all zeros, so 0.0.0 slash .0, .0, 0, and that would cause all the traffic to go through the tunnel because we would consider everything to be protected networks. And so that means we would send everything through the tunnel. Now, you can do that if you want, but in our case, we don't want to do that. And that's very applicable right now in today's world where we have a lot of remote workers. If you're sending all of their traffic through the SRX device for all your remote workers, that might overwhelm your SRX device. So let's avoid that and just send the traffic through the tunnel that we need to send. Okay, so that almost finishes the configuration. We need to scroll down under IKE and IPsec settings, and this is going to be under IKE. We need to specify an email address. And I actually changed that keep alive. I believe it was at 10, so we'll change that back. And we're going to say lab at edu.juniper.net. And that's going to be a part of the IKE ID. And so we can go up here and click save, and then we'll have one more thing it'll prompt us for. It'll say new profile name. What this is, is this is the dynamic configuration in the CLI. And so we'll need to specify the name, and then we'll need to set it to shared as well. So we'll set this as ra-dyn-sd-lb for the name, and we'll set it to shared. And we've completed that configuration. But remember, we need to jump to the access configuration before we push this VPN configuration to SRX1. So that is going to be under user firewall management and then access profile. And you'll see this is that access profile we created. So we can select that and click update, and that'll push it out to SRX1. You need to select SRX1, click update, confirm it. And let's go ahead and click on the job number, and we'll see. Great, that worked out 100% successful state. So we're good there. So let's go ahead and jump back to configure and then go to IPsec VPN then IPsec VPNs and then select our remote access Juniper Secure Connect VPN and click update. And we'll click publish and update. Confirm it. All right, so that job completed successfully. That's great. So let's go ahead and jump to the remote worker device and see how this works. Okay, so here is the remote worker device. And first I want to show that we actually can't reach that server, server one, from the remote worker device if we're not connected through the VPN. And that's perfect, that's what we want to see. If this wasn't the case, then this would mean that anybody on the internet could reach it. So that's great. Well, with that, let's go ahead and use Juniper Secure Connect that I have right here. And you can see I've already created a profile for something else. Let's create a new connection. And with this, notice that it auto-populated the gateway address. Now, if this was your first time using Juniper Secure Connect, you would need to type this in. And so we've typed in this information. And let's click the connection button. And we're prompted for our user ID and password. And then we're presented with a certificate warning. Now, why are we presented with this? Well, the reason is 
This is the local certificate that we created. This is not going to be a trusted certificate by default because we created it, not a trusted certificate authority. So we can just accept this. And you can see here, I want to show that the IP address is a part of this certificate. That's very important. So let's click accept. And then the VPN is starting to establish. And the connection is successful. Great. And look at the side here. We can see that the communication is occurring like it should. We can reach server one using its IP address. And so perfect. That's what we want to see. Now, something else I do want to show is since we are doing split tunneling, you can look at the data here. You can see that we've sent some data, received some data. There's 113 or 1113 and 1113. And so what happens if we send something to an internet address like uh, the Google DNS server? And notice how that doesn't increment. Those were still at the same numbers that we were before. And that's perfect. That's what we want to see. and it doesn't go through the tunnel because we configured it that way. And so if we were to ping the server again, you can see that the data transmit kilobytes and data receive in kilobytes is incrementing. And that's perfect. That's exactly what we want to see. So that brings us to the end of this learning byte. In this learning byte, we demonstrated how to configure and verify Juniper Secure Connect using Security Director. So as always, thanks for watching. Visit the Juniper Education Services website to learn more about courses. View our full range of classroom, online, and e-learning courses. Learning paths, industry segment and technology specific training paths. Juniper Networks Certification Program, the ultimate demonstration of your competence. And the training community, from forums to social media, join the discussion.